Hi, hi, hi. Oh, we're ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Morning. Oh, yeah, get you to stand with us. You should have gotten a handout when you came in. It's got all the songs we're going to sing today. We're so looking forward to worshiping with you. Please worship with us. And let's raise a hallelujah. Y'all ready for this? Let's love on Jesus today. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise, raise a hallelujah. hallelujah. Lord. My weapon is a melody. I raise, raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Yeah. You believe that today? Come on now. I'm gonna say in the middle of the storm. Today, I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness feel. I raise a hallelujah. Fourth singing right here. You sing this back to me. Sing a little louder. Sing it out. Sing a little louder. 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 Let's sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hey, my name is Richard. We're so thankful that you're here today. We have. Hey, my name is Richard. We're so thankful that you're here today. We have an air-conditioned room upstairs where you can watch the service. If maybe the heat's a little rough on you today, it's right up these stairs to my right, your left. Thank you for those up there. Thank you for you guys that are joining us online. Just what a glorious day to be in the house of the Lord. Father, we just love you today. We thank you for your blessings. We just thank you for this opportunity that you have given us. None of us are here by accident. God, just bless our worship time. Bless Jeremiah as he brings the message he was given us for us. Bless us to receive what you have for us. So we leave here changed in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So I hope you know this oldie but goodie. Some bright morning when this life is over. can be seated. First thing we want to do, if you have children that you signed up for our children's church, or even if they're not already registered, we like our children to worship with us a little while before they go over and go to their class. So there's a young lady standing right over there, waving her arms, all our children that are going to go to children's church. You can release your kids and they'll, they'll take care of them for the rest of the service. Thank you so much and God bless you. Man, what an awesome day. I didn't think I needed a fan, but I had to break it out. Feeling a little pumped today for some reason. Maybe I know why. First thing I want to talk about is we had a Hope for the Coast food giveaway yesterday. Amen. We had lots of volunteers, so thank you for everybody who came out here and worked so hard yesterday to give away food. So we gave away 9,038 9, pounds of food. Now, that might not make a lot of sense to people, but let's just break it down a little further. That's 437 families, not people. Thank 437 you, families were fed yesterday in our drive through Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And if that were not enough, there's two ministries. Uh, one is called New Life, and one is called Christian Service Center. So we delivered more over Enough food to feed 200, over 200 more families to those two ministries that are located wow. in this area as well. Yes. So some total, that's 637 plus families that we were able to deliver food to yesterday. So, so give God glory and thanks for that. And thank you again for all you guys. Uh, so Hope for the Coast was amazing. Uh, Brightbridge, I think uh, on, the, on the fourth Tuesday of every month, which will be this coming Tuesday, we have a ministry that we partner with over in Pensacola. So we've been having another work day with those guys. Celebrate recoveries at 6.30 um, on Wednesdays. Listen, I'm not going to regurgitate all this stuff that's in this paper because you have it in your hands. So you can look it up. Any questions? We have a men's group on Tuesday mornings. We have a Bible study on Wednesday nights. We have a women's group that meets. Any questions that you might have, 
That table's called Ask Me. They've got all the answers to any question that's going on around this place. If you're looking for a group, you look for a chance to serve, whatever it may be, you ask these guys and they can answer your questions. So with that being said, I want you guys to stand up. We're going to play a little, uh, little rock blues for you guys called Blue on Black while y'all meet and greet. Meet somebody new. Shake a hand, hug a neck, bump a fist, whatever it is. fun for the band so this is a great time after that announcement I just made about all the food that we're doing and all the work that we're doing you know that's made you know how that's made possible right it's made possible by beautiful people volunteering their time but lots of time even more so for people who donate of their finances to help us purchase those things that we go and bless others with and that's the time that we do this with you know and we do that not like like any other you know, we, we don't have a ton of expenses here. The floor mama gives us this place for free. We don't charge us utilities, don't charge us rent. The waters you're drinking, they provide. They're a beautiful partner for us in Central as we have church here every Sunday. So it allows us more the money that we give every Sunday goes back to serve our community and bless others. So we're about to pass an offering um, buckets, I guess we call them around here. These guys are going to come forward. So we're going to play a little music and we're going to take up our offering. And then uh, we'll start playing some. And then we got a couple more songs of worship. I'll ask you to stand and we'll enter back into worship with two beautiful songs. But Lord, right now, we just want to thank you for this opportunity to give. We're so blessed, Lord. And we're so thankful and we're so grateful of the abundance that we have. So help us to be a blessing to others, dear Lord. What a blessing it is to give and to be a blessing to others, dear Jesus. So we ask you to bless and anoint this time as we give, a time as important as any other that allows us to grow ministry, to reach so many more people, to feed people, to clothe people, and to bless people. Father, hurricane season is upon us. We have one coming into the Gulf very soon. It's a reminder of just how desperate some people may be in just a short period of time, God. So help us to keep that in mind as we be a blessing so we can bless others. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. These guys are going to come forward now. You know, I didn't miss something. We have a guest keyboard player here today. This is Miss Abby. She's from Arkansas. Suey, Suey, Pig Suey. No, you're not? Yes, you are. Don't try to deny it. Anyway, this is Sarah and Chris's daughter in town visiting. Great keyboard player. 
plays in her own home church band, and we're so honored to have you, Abby. Yes. Sorry that I forgot to mention it. guys to stand back up with us. One of my favorite songs that we do. Of course, I think I say that about every song. How strong we are when we stand in His love. Let's lift that up, Dave. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal joy I own. When brokenness and pain is all I know. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. Let's lift this up. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in here. Love my tears doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Hey! Well, shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken, yeah. Oh, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, I like this here. Every chain There's power That can empty out a grave There's resurrection Power that can save Power in your name There's power in your name Oh, there's power There's power That can break off every chain There's power That can empty out a grave Power that I can say, power in your name, power in your name. Well, doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Hey, No, my fear don't stand a chance When I'm standing in your love oh. Lord, thank you, Lord Thank you, Jesus So, uh, here a while back, over about a three-week period Three different people requested a song from the mid-90s, a song called Shout to the Lord, a song written by a young girl at the time, a young teenage girl new to her faith, and her name is Darlene Zychek. And this song, she wrote for herself, going through some troubles and sitting at her piano and reading the Psalms, it's talking about 
essentially something we already sang about today. Praise the new storm, shouting to the Lord, no matter what. And then we lift him up above. It just puts our eyes on him and our circumstances become his problem, not ours. And we shout to him no matter what. So she wrote this song out of that context, and it went on to launch a ministry out of Australia called Hillsong that impacted the entire world. And she went on to be one of the greatest worship leaders. A scared little girl went on to become one of the greatest worship leaders of our time, Darling Zychek. So three different people asked me about that song. The third person that asked me about that song gave me that history of that song. And I told Gary, I'm like, you know what? Put it on the schedule, let's learn it. So let's shout to the Lord today. The girls are going to sing it. God bless you. Thank you for being here. We'll be introducing Mr. Jeremiah after this. Man. 
Hey, let's give one more shout of hallelujah. One, two, three. Hallelujah. You may be seated. You, God Lord. bless you. So what an honor and privilege it is to uh, introduce Mr. Jeremiah Castile to speak to us today. So Jeremiah, in case you didn't know, most of you probably do, had quite a career at Alabama. For some time, he was the interception leader as a cornerback there. And one cool fact that I thought was awesome when I was looking him up to, that I didn't remember is that he played on the last team coached by Coach Bear Bryant. That's a pretty cool memory to have there. Roll Tide, somebody. Yeah. <laughs> he went on to be drafted by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and then he spent some time there, then he went to the Denver Broncos, had quite an NFL career. And Jeremiah, we're honored to have you here, we're brother. We're looking forward to what God has given you for us. Thank you so much. Come on. This is yours. Warm welcome to Mr. Jeremiah Castillo. Good morning. Thank Richard and Mike for inviting us on this beautiful Sunday morning to be here at, uh, in worship, and uh, we're excited about, I'm just excited about my walk with the Lord. How about you? Amen? Amen. And, uh, just a little bit more background on me from Columbus, Georgia, but finished high school in Alabama, went on in 1979 and played for Coach Bryant, was there his last four years. And uh, as a boy growing up, I'm number eight of nine. And uh, my father got out of the military there in Columbus, Georgia at the base, Fort Benning. But I grew up in an alcoholic home. Alcoholism, drugs, domestic violence, low income, everything that should say I should have been a victim. And I share that with you this morning because if, as I open up God's word and present it to you, I don't know how to do it but one way. And that's excited, enthused about who God is. Some people don't like that style, but that's just my style. So you're going to have to hold on for a few minutes if that's not your style. Amen. I just I'm kind of just giving you a little warning on because some people, I'm not used to that. Well, I just preached the way I played. <laughs> Amen. So. You know, playing for Coach Bryant, you was going to do it one way, wide open. And probably a lot of you saw games that way. You know, God blessed me with the great opportunity to play, in Coach, to play for Coach Bryant's last four years, to be the MVP of his last game, and to be one of eight men that, bear, that was a pallbearer. That's my greatest honor right there, being called by the Bryant family. Amen. <clears throat> so when I got to Alabama in 1979, it was a dream come true for me as a little kid growing up, watching the Coach Bryant show on Sundays. Still can see it, Coach Bryant sitting there with Charlie Thornton, Coca-Cola, Blaze, uh, Golden Flake potato chip. More drove low on the tackle from Phoenix City, Alabama. Bingo. Woodrow Lowe was from where I grew up. I could take a rock, chunk it back behind the house there. And so I got, I, I'm here. Woodrow Lowe, I, I know that guy. That's going to be me one day. A few years later, God allowed the University of Alabama to offer me a scholarship. And 42 years later, that little 18-year-old kid has been married now, going on 40 years. Amen. Six children. All six attended the University of Alabama. Three boys, three girls. 
All three of my boys played for the University of Alabama. All, all three have either coached or played for Coach Saban. This is my 21st year as the chaplain there. So people ask me, why are you still doing it? Because I'm eternally indebted to the place. God changed my life radically at the University of Alabama. Opportunity was presented to me. I took advantage of it, and my, it changed my entire family. My children didn't grow up like I grew up. Presented an opportunity for me to change the economic situation in my family. And that's what we did. So people, why are you going? I'm eternally indebted to the place. And saints, regardless of what we, the narrative that you may hear on television, let me tell you, God has used sports so powerfully in this country when it comes to race relations. Powerfully. That deserves a, an applause right there. Amen. Because on any... Amen. On any given Saturday, we all sitting in that stadium and we're, you're one. For whoever you're pulling for. And so God allowed that opportunity for me. And I just believe in telling, being, speaking truth. My life was blessed. And God has blessed a lot tremendous amount of African Americans with integration. Woo! So I just needed to say that because I'm, I, my family has been blessed and I believe in speaking truth. And Coach Bryant was a father figure for me. You know, one of the first things I came to understand from being in, in his presence, he loved me as a person. So when Coach Brian asked us to jump, it was how high. Amen. Well, let's get into our message. Uh, today, I, I want to talk to you. I got to get some of this stuff. We want to talk. I, 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 every year we do a theme. Every year I do a theme. This year our theme is um, becoming one. It's our theme for, for our team. Every year we have a, we have a theme. Um, I can remember the first championship year. I got too much stuff up here. 2009, uh, our theme was the heart of a champion. 2017, when we had that awesome game against Georgia in the Georgia Dome, and we threw that ball to or through that freshman. The freshman is what I call it. Uh, if y'all remember, we, our theme that year was in pursuit of excellence. Mm. Today, I, I just want to take a few moments and talk to you about becoming one the power of unity, how important that is. You know, when you take a team, you have to become one, even though you have what? Different members on that team, different positions. But what's, what makes a coach, a coach's job is to bring all of those people to get all those players and go in one direction. You have one vision. You can't have five visions. It's one vision. Everybody has to buy into that vision. Amen? That's how it works. I think that's how it works corporately. It should work that way in every, really, organization in life. And you know what? It comes from God's Word. But how easily we can look in life and see that we don't see this a lot of times. And when you don't have this principle being operated in, uh, what's going to come from it is defeat. You know the team that lost yesterday was the one that didn't work on becoming one. You know, you get in the huddle. I was on the defensive side of the ball. They call a play. That, when that play is called, it tells the defensive line what to do. It tells the linebackers what to do, and it tells the secondary what to do. Now, if I'm a, in the secondary and I decide I'm going to be, I want to carry out the, the defensive tackle's job, how is that going to work? A lot of times, that's how we may be in life. We see, well, I want to do that guy's job. No, God gave you a job to do. So I couldn't, I had to do what, the, what was 
assigned to me do my job. And then we all, when we all carry out and we carry out the assignment, then we can be on one accord and guess what comes from it? We call it success, don't we? I like the word prosperity. We prosper. Why don't we see more prosperity in our world? People have a problem becoming one. What's involved in it? I, I, three things that character, vision, discipline. You know what you, you saw yesterday? Every team displayed character, vision, discipline. And the one that executed it at the highest level is the one that ends up with the victory. Let me ask you, isn't it you want to be victorious? If I was to just interview this one, what is it out of life you want to get? You say, I want to win. Amen? The, the world wants to win, but God has a what? A formula for how it happens. Let me read to you one of the most powerful scriptures in Psalms 133. Y'all have that on there? You see that? Look, listen to what it says. Behold. I got to stop right there. Because when it says behold, it means stop. <laughs> you familiar in the New Testament when Jesus is coming to be baptized? John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God. Behold, what God is saying right there when he says behold is everything you're about to hear that follows, you listen up. It's important. So everything that follows, behold, he's saying this morning, listen up. It's important how good and how pleasant it is for what brethren to dwell together in unity. You know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We all sisters and brothers. Mm. I need to pause right there. And you need to think about that. Matter of fact, you need to do more than just think about it. You need to meditate on it. Because the enemy wants you to think, well, he's a different color. He got a different mother. <laughs> Might not be my brother, <laughs> so to speak. No, I'm a, a brother with a different mother of another color with the same heavenly father. Woo! Amen? A amen. So, so what does that mean? That means then guess what? You ought to have a love for me. I'm in the family. So what does a team have to have? A team, those guys have to have a love for one another. You ever watch them big old guys up front, them defensive tackles, defensive line? Man, them big old burly guys. You know one of the things they got to do on a lot of plays? They have to sacrifice. They got to go in there and let two, three guys hit them and just pop, 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 pop them. So the linebacker can run free to make the tackle. It's called sacrifice. You use the word love. Sacrifice should be with it. Don't use it if you're not willing to sacrifice. Every time you look at a cross, love and sacrifice is what you should see from it. Regardless of how glittery it is, how awesome and how, what kind of, love and sacrifice. That's what it takes, saints, to become one. When you get this in a family, when there's love in a family. Where did God start with this at? He started in Genesis. We don't, we're not going to go there, but listen to what it says in Genesis 1, 26. Let us make man, woman, in our image, in our likeness. So you and I, each and every human being you see, regardless of how you feel about them, they're made in the image of God. Mm. They're image bearers. So that means that they carry a place of importance in the earth.
you need to meditate on what I just said. Because we can be quickly to mistreat people based on how we feel. I said they carry a, an important position in the earth. They're image bearers. Do you see people that way? Do you see the less fortunate that way? 1979, two days. Man, I don't have time to preach all this sermon, but I'm going to just hit some high points. So I'm a little 18-year-old poor black kid from Phoenix City, Alabama. Been in camp two weeks there. I'm on the 1978 returning national championship team, and I come in from practice. We had real two days back then. I kid with the coach. I said, man, y'all babysitting now. Two practices, two days in a row. We can't do that. We had 30 days of them. Man, about that second week, guess what? Rigor mortis setting in on your body. Man. <laughs> I can't. So I come in from practicing. On my, on my uh, locker, there's a pink sticky note. Still can see it. Sitting there on my locker. Coach Bryant want to see you. Hmm. Well, I don't want to see him. I go up third floor, Coleman Coliseum, Linda Knowles, secretary, walk through the door. She said, have a seat. I'll be with you in a minute. Long minute, long minute. Door opens up. I walk in. Coach Brian sitting there. I got a Kodak moment of this. He's sitting at his desk, and he's puffing on one of them Chesterfield. I interpreted what he said. You had to really listen to him. He interpreted, go sit on the couch. I sat on that couch. I kept going down. I right, kept going down, down, down. You looking up at him. He cut the legs off that couch. <laughs> True story. You sitting there looking up at him. <laughs> Black and white checker couch in the Bryant Museum. You can go and look at it today. First words, tell me. Yeah, Ma. You, you can play here at the University of Alabama. Said Jeremiah, you can play here at the University of Alabama. I'm sitting thinking, yeah, when my turn comes, right? Uh, that, yeah. His next words You can play this year. So that's a 78 national championship team that I'm coming in on 79 on. He's saying, You can play this year. If you know, go far back enough, you know that we had a freshman team. He was saying, I'm not going to let you play freshman ball. I'm pulling you up to this returning national championship team, and you're going to play this year as a true freshman. That's rare, Saints, back in those days. In those two weeks of practice, he saw, saw something in me as a 5'9", 155-pound <laughs> defensive back. You can play this year. What I love to tell people is, boy, did I play. Boy, did I play. When the last time you spoke a word of encouragement to somebody that may not physically fit the bill? Because that's what I was, undersized. Matter of fact, that school down the road told me I was too small. You too little. How many times you think I heard those words? Paul W. Bryant didn't think so. You can play here. Boy, did I play. Four years later, I'm an All-American. Four years later, I'm tied to record in interceptions. Four years later, I'm 72nd player taken in the draft. He looked at me four years early and said, ain't no way he, he, he don't even look like he's a football player. Heading out the door, Jeremiah, see that door right there? That door is always open. You ever have a problem, don't you hesitate to come knock on it. Mm. I knew somebody cared for me. 
So when he asked us to jump, it was how high? What does our world need? That right there, what I just shared with you. I tell, I love, you know, I love to tell people, man, I walked in there 5'9", I walked out 6'9". Woo! 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 So God is saying to us, behold, how what? Good and how pleasant. Good and pleasant, powerful adjectives, right? Amen? It is for what? You and I. And how many times we allow circumstances to come in to bring conflict, to bring division? How many times it happens in our families? So I said, Genesis 126, let us make man. So what is God saying right there? He's saying, I'm going to become one with man. So when you come over to Genesis 2, guess what you find? When he brings Adam and Eve together, he says, and the two shall become. What happened to that in marriages today? How easily we let what? Circumstances, situations divide the two, and they never become one. So in God's eyes, when he looks down on a family, what does he look? He sees one. Is that your mindset in your home? See, we all as children growing up, the plan was, is that the ultimate plan would have been for, God, for a child to see a husband, and a mom, and a dad grow up becoming one in unity that's powerful, saints. But what, for most people, what do they grow up seeing is conflict and division. How do I know? I grew up in one. And let me tell you what God did. At 13, he saved me. I came to Jesus at 13. And all the power, all the power I needed and the wisdom I needed in the accolades you've heard, the accomplishments you've heard, started then. When I came to know Jesus, little old bitty Baptist church there in Phoenix City, summer of 1974, walked in there. Walked in that summer, they was having revival, and they said, you, you saved? I said, what that mean? So you must not be, sit on the front row. They put me on the front row. They called it the mourner's bench. Anybody ever heard that word? And for the first time in my life, the gospel was, I heard it. Jesus loved me. He loved Jeremiah just like he was. He loved me. And boy, how I needed to hear that God loved me. I don't know who, in this, can I share? This morning, you need to know that Jesus loves you. Right where you're at. Right where I was at with an alcoholic mother. Domestic violence, drugs, and everything. And when I believed and received him, the power to overcome all of that became available to me because God, the Holy Spirit, came to live within me. Now, what have I shared with you? That's how you become one with God. And the power, the wisdom in my life, the circumstances didn't change, the situation didn't change, the alcoholism didn't change, the domestic violence didn't change, but God gave me a power and authority over it and a vision for my life. That's what people need, saints. You don't have to sit around and talk about their problems. Give them the solution. His name is Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Whew. Eleven years later, when I got drafted, the first thing I did with my paycheck was put my mother in rehab. Thirty days later, she came out sober and saved. Woo! Mmm. Mmm. Wonder why I'm fired up. Mmm. I've seen the promises of God come true. Promises that I 
got out on the side of my bed as a teenage boy. I said, hey, Lord, one day I want to see my mother. So I want to see my. And Mary Castile lived the next 34 years of her life sober. Sober. Fourth grade education. My lady about this tall. We buried her in Columbus, Georgia. We had a funeral there. She's going to church in Columbus, Georgia. And she, so the pastor said to me, he said, hey, I need to tell you this about a mother. It was a mixed congregation. He said, last 30 years, your mother led more people to Christ in this church than anybody else. Mm. So let me go back to this verse here. It says, Together in unity, it is like a precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. You know what it's talking about? Anointing. When they anointed the priest, who's the anointed one? Jesus. When you know him, when God the Holy Spirit lives in you, then you have an anointing. You have the anointing. You have the power. That's why I didn't become a victim of my environment in my community. There was an anointing on me, living in me and through me. <laughs> How Mary Cast did I didn't take another drink? There was the anointing when she surrendered. Lived the next 34 years of her life. 11 years to my mom share this story with you, and we're going to get ready to close. 11 years. My mother had been sober 11 years, New Year's of 1996, I, which I was visiting her, I, living in Birmingham, walking in her house. She had a little den in the back room there, and I walk in, and she's on the phone, and I could tell something's wrong, and she hangs the phone up and says, baby, that was the chaplain at a prison in Alabama. Said, your brother's been murdered. This was her next words. You know, the, your brother wasn't the victim. The real victim in this was the man that did the killing. Would that have been your response? And saints, that challenged Jeremiah. I spent, my wife and I spent the night, that night I'm on the side of the bed, I'm thinking about this. And the Holy Spirit said, pray for that man. Hmm? Huh? You want me to do what? Pray for him. And I obeyed God, and I prayed for him. Can't tell you what I prayed. I said, Lord, this man needs the gospel. Lord, this man needs the gospel. Two years go by. I call it a Holy Ghost setup. I'm walking off the field coaching football. Somebody that has a prison ministry comes up and says, hey, I, I'd like for you to go do this chapel with me. A couple of weeks go by. I go do the chapel, finish the chapel, and one of the prisoners there said, hey, let me ask you, did you have a brother named Joseph? I said, yeah. So the guy that killed your brother is in this prison. He said, uh, we do these every month. Will you come back next month? If you say you will, I'll make sure he's there. I go back 30 days later. Enter into the building. He's already, that gentleman that killed, is sitting there on the front row. What do you do? What do you say? Lord said, you go to him. And as I got within arm's length of that man, the Lord said, embrace him. Embrace him. And in the midst of me embracing him, can I share something with you, saints, what I experienced? God saying, this is how I embraced you in your trespasses and sins. This is how I loved you in your trespasses and sins. And I'm going to tell you, it was uncomfortable. 
And I'm kind of trying to, he said, no, stay right here. I want you to stay close enough you can smell his breath. He said, you look him in his eye. And you tell him that you've forgiven him. You look him in his eye. And you tell him that Jesus loves him. What Jesus died for is that for all of us, when conflict hits, when it comes, that we look to him. We turn to him. Four years later, my mother got a letter from that gentleman. Dear Mrs. Castile, didn't have a lot to do on this Monday night, but I, I needed to write you. I don't know how you took me killing your son, but Mrs. Castile, I've asked God to forgive me. See, he took a little poor black boy from Phoenix City, Alabama, saved him, reconciled him, that he could take Jesus to someone that needed reconciling. Was he my enemy at that time? Yes. Were you and I God's enemy at, that time, at one time? Yes. What did Jesus do? He reconciled us. I'm going to close with this reading. By, I got this from Kerry Job. I know we run a little bit over, but th- is that all right? Amen. Let me, let me read this to you. See, you need to know who you're worshiping. You need to know who he is. All power, all authority belongs to him. He created you and me. It's called words. If there are words for him, I don't have them. You see, my mind has yet reached a point where it can form a thought that could adequately describe the greatness of my God. And my lungs have not yet developed the ability to release a breath with enough agility to breathe out the greatness of his love. And my voice, you see, my voice is so inhibited, restrained by human limits that it's hard to even send up a praise. You see, if there are words for him, I don't have them. My God, his grace is remarkable. Mercies are innumerable. Strength is impenetrable. He's honorable, accountable, favorable. He's unsearchable, yet knowable. Indefinable, yet approachable. Indescribable, yet personal. He's beyond comprehension, further than imagination. Constant through every generation. King of every nation. But if there are words for him, I don't have them. You see, my words are few, and to try and capture the one true God using my vocabulary would never do, but I use words as an expression, an expression of worship to a Savior, a Savior who is both worthy and deserving of my praise. So I use words. My heart extols the Lord, blesses his name forever. He's won my heart, captured my mind, bound them both together. He's defeated me in my rebellion, conquered my sin and he's welcomed me in to his presence, completely invited me in. He's made himself the object of my sight, flooding me with mercies in the morning, drowning me with grace in the night. But if there are words for him, I don't have them. But what I do have is good news, for my God knew that man-made words wouldn't do, for words are just tools we use to point to the truth. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, as the word living proof. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, giving nothing this formation. And by his word he sustains in the power of his name, for he is before all things and over all things he reigns. Holy is his name, so praise him for his life. The way he persevered in strife, the humble son of God, becoming the perfect sacrifice. Praise him for his death, that he willingly stood in our place, that he lovingly endured the grave, that he battled our enemy, and on the third day rose in victory. Hallelujah. He's everything that was promised. Praise him as a risen king. Lift your voice and sing, for one day he will return for us, and we will finally be united with our Savior for eternity. So it's not just words. I proclaim, for my words point to the word, and the word has a name. Hope has a name. Joy has a name. 
Peace has a name. Love has a name. And that name is Jesus Christ. Praise his name forever. Amen. Woo. Thank you all. God bless you. Amen. Thank you all for having us. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jeremiah. Yeah, let's hear it. Thank you, man. Yeah, we're so grateful that you guys are here. You know, we always, um, when we leave, we just uh, have this scripture out of Romans 31. said, if God be for you, who can be against you? You guys have a blessed week. Thank you so much for being here. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus.